he was an he was an uncredited star of Blondie's Reward. Remember Blondie's Reward? Everybody remembers Blondie's Reward. Yes, that's wild. That is wild. He appeared in but Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, and they only directed three movies. Yeah, yeah, those three, and we all got to see him. Well, those of us who have taste in film got to see him. Me being one of those people. I would say Beast of Yucca Flats is the most insufferable out of all of them. Because you just you just want it to be over. But there's something about Skydivers that is so hilarious and entertaining. It 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 is the best of the three. Red Zone Cuba... You're clapping when Coleman Francis gets shot down at the end. You're clapping because you're like, oh, thank God. Thank fuck this guy is dead. And that's when he and his buddies, they go and invade the whole or the, they're the, part of the whole Bay of Pigs thing. It's great. So I guess that's really super respectful. No? Super respectful. And all the people that, you know, were playing like, you know, was it Cuban people? None of them. They were all white and all in, like, Coleman Francis's family. If you watch the credits, every last fucker has the last name Francis, except for his buddies. Welcome to the IA Critic oh, Podcast. God damn it. 1994, I'm professional film critic Sean Patrick. With me is Amy. Hi. And MJ. And MJ. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I'm talking to a support thing for something. It's stupid. You need support, don't you? After what? Watching Terminal Velocity, which you don't remember, you need support. Uh, In fact, MJ, why don't you, after Amy gives us the sponsor read, why don't you give us the breakdown of Terminal Velocity? Uh, Amy? uh, Oh, uh, the podcast is sponsored by the Pontiac Fiero, the Coleman Francis of cars. So, MJ, tell us about Terminal Velocity. (laughs) Terminal Velocity, wow. Um, (laughs) Tell us about your favorite parts. Um... There, I, it wasn't my favorite part, but in the beginning, there were not ashless, assless chaps. And that was the extent of it. That's right, because his ass wasn't really his ass, was it? He was assless. He was without ass. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chewy, you want to tell us about Terminal Velocity? I think he probably remembers more about Terminal Velocity than any of us do. Mm. Probably. Yeah. Um. Uh, the movie. It. You know what? We had one good movie. Didn't we have one good movie with Charlie Shane that we watched? Didn't we? Did we? I thought we did. Yeah. We did, uh, so... Hot Shots Part 2. Oh, that's right. Yes. yes. Hot Shots Part 2 turned out great. We did love that, and we loved him in it. I... When you when you get this movie started, you almost feel like it could be a parody, because like the jokes, they 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 almost they almost could be. His name is fucking Ditch in it. He is Ditch. He is a uh, skydiving expert who teaches people to skydive. A woman jumps out of a plane and doesn't pull her chute and dies, uh, and he's uh, in trouble. Yeah. Because he 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 know he he's in trouble for killing her or something. <laughs> <laughs> Did you properly ditch tell her about how to pull her chute? Why didn't she pull her chute? Oh, ditch. No. Because remember the whole thing with ditch was that he okay. So he has this woman who out of nowhere comes in and says, "I just want to try skydiving. I've never done it before." And she's played by the beautiful. N- N- oh, uh, Nastasia Kinski, right? <laughs> I almost said Natasha Henstridge, but I don't think that was correct. Um, and and she, you know, she's like playing all. I've never done this before, and then gets up in the plane with Charlie Sheen, who is a skydiving professional. We'll say she weirdly insists on wearing wearing an orange jumpsuit like she's escaping from prison. I thought that was given to her. <laughs> she insisted upon that one. We should really clarify too. Charlie Sheen is a a skydiving Ditch. instructor, yeah, instructor who who doesn't play by the rules. Like we we should, <laughs> we need to put that out there. Well, because he jumps assless chaps into a children's party that gets broadcast on the news. Yeah, and that everybody 
uh, in- including uh, and nobody's surprised when when Ditch Brody shows up without pants on. Ditch Brody, God, is that not the most nineties movie name? <laughs> You're gonna play Ditch Brody. He is I'm a Charlie skydiver. Sheen. I play Ditch Brody. You're gonna play Ditch Brody. He's a skydiver. He doesn't play by the rules. We're just gonna go ahead and put that out there now. And Charlie no Sheen's rules. like, yeah, yeah. Tell me more. He's got zero rules. Zero rules. Um, so anyway, so he gets, you know, we got, we got the whole Kinski thing. Kinski comes in, fabulous, beautiful, immediately Charlie Sheen's attracted to her because he fucks anything that walks because he's Charlie Sheen. Yeah. And he's thinking about getting her into bed the second he sees her. Immediately. Immediately. What makes it so heartbreaking when she dies horribly. Um, because, or does she? But do you know why? Da, da, da. But do you know why? Because hmm. he, they, they weren't sure if he hooked her in. Yeah, that's the whole thing. Like you have to hook him into the plane. Noble and then he can uh, Melvin Van Peebles wasn't sure if he saw it or not that she that he locked her in. That's right, and and that's a rule that when you take somebody up, only the instructor can unlock you. But it's funny how she knew how to unlock herself. What? With it being her first time up in the air. Oh. How am I remembering more about this movie than because we were just Fuzzy and I were just saying, you know what? I don't remember shit about this movie, <laughs> and now it's like all coming it back just to me. Came back to your head. See, I I'm not. I I wish I could get the download. Where is it at? Is it is it there? The <laughs> just touch my oh, hand. Uh, you still don't remember, do you? I don't. No, that's fine. Man, <laughs> I thought that would work. So yeah, if you can imagine what's going on here in this movie. It's 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 vertigo with skydivers, or it's just skydivers with skydivers. <laughs> <laughs> the Coleman Francis classic. So it's, it's Nastasha Kinski is is Kim Novak, and uh, yeah. and, and that should be a spoiler if it, if you understand that reference, then you understand that that's a spoiler. Uh, her na- her 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 roommate got murdered, um, and she's use their roommate's body to replace hers to make it appear that she's been murdered so she can escape from bad people. Um, Spoilers. You literally just gave the whole thing away. Don't tell the ending to Terminal Velocity. Sometime later, Ditch and Chris <laughs> receive official commendations at the Kremlin for their actions preventing a coup. That's right. Just like Vertigo. Just like Vertigo. <laughs> I think I'm just like Skydivers, too. <laughs> No, that doesn't happen in Skydivers. What happens in Skydivers? Uh, well, the, the Skydivers. Uh, her, the the main main man and his wife they they own the skydiving uh building and area. Which, by the way, in Terminal Velocity, that whole building and everything looks exactly like where they filmed Skydivers. So, like, I would be curious to see if there is like some sort of correlation there because everything down to the whole hangar. Looks just like the same one from Skydivers. Anyway, um, you know, in Skydivers, this guy. Joe Moss. Huh? Joe Moss. He has a Joe. Hey, Joe. Played Um, by Eric Tomlin. Do you want some? No, that's that's Joe. That's the guy who comes to town that his wife has an affair with. But that's okay because the main guy, he has an affair with. With Harry? Harry. (laughs) Harry. What's happened to us? It's one of my favorite lines. Um, <laughs> and and so the guy that Harry has, or the girl that Harry has an affair with, she puts acid in his chute and he falls to his death. So then his wife has to close down the entire hangar and she wears a big giant hat like like Audrey Hepburn in the end. And then she walks away. And this then, is more like Strangers on a Train. Oh, it's awesome. It's such a great movie. <laughs> Again, out of all the Coleman Francis movies, it's the best movie. The acting is horrible and I love every second of it. And the music too. The music is wild in it. So I would tell people, go watch Skydivers. Instead of Terminal Velocity. Instead of Terminal Velocity? Absolutely. That's, uh, that's... It's far more entertaining. Far more entertaining. And if you have the Mystery Science Theater version of it, all the better. Watch that one instead. Because there's a whole thing about coffee in it. And it's just one of the funniest little bits that they keep sewing throughout the film. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you like your coffee? Uh, Terminal coffee. Velocity was uh, written by David Tui, the future director of Pitch Black. Uh, he should have directed this movie, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Pitch Black. Was that Vin Pitch Diesel? Black, yeah, Vin Diesel. Actually, a pretty good sci-fi flick. Well, I just remember the 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 ad for it, and like it was like all dark, 
and then it came up and like there's all these like kind of weird creature things around Vin Diesel. Is yeah. that how am I remembering that right? Or is that yeah, the vanilla? The, the darkness, uh the darkness is made up of a lot of little beings that'll come and eat you alive. Oh, I wish. <laughs> um yeah. But, but not a single skydiving sequence in the entire movie. <laughs> it's not? No, there's no skydiving whatsoever in, in Pitch Black that I can recall. Can we just say, though, I mean, if we're going to just call a spade a spade in the 90s, I think that Point Break is the last word on skydiving movies. Hmm. It's, it's again, far more entertaining, darker, excellent soundtrack. More associated with surfing, though, than it is skydiving. Yeah, but they still skydive in They it. do, but... Let's just have it be the final last word. Because terminal velocity is awful. And then, you know, I mean, the, I mean, the, the whole thing over, you know, overarching is just I just would rather watch skydivers from assless chaps to to the death of seemingly Nastasha Kinski's character to the end of the movie. Nothing else happens. Like literally nothing else happens. <laughs> There's not a scene that after that that is actually worth discussing. Yeah. Well, oh, but that when they make love on that on that carpet. I've always wanted to say make love when it comes to Charlie Sheen. Um, they actually do. They roll around on the, like that that bare carpet in that house, don't they? God, am I misremembering or am I just like having fantasies? No, you're the only one who remembers the movie. God, why am I the only one that remembers it? Because it's not very good. Yeah, but I I feel like I probably have the most trauma then. <laughs> no, you've got what do you have is mystery science theater training. Uh, yeah, which means you can sit through terrible things and and be okay with it. <laughs> MJ does not have that. No. They have no ability to to survive bad movies. No, I just uh, tune them out. They uh, go in one ear and out the other. <laughs> they just sort of happen in front of you. Yeah. What is your? Uh, what's your? Uh, do you do you know much about Mister Charlie Sheen? Ah, uh, not much. Uh, the only thing i know him for really is um two and a half yep two and a half man men yep <laughs> two and a half man, <laughs> and a half man. <laughs> he's he's a man but he's two and a half years old <laughs> or he's two and a half man in one he's one oh, man, the trench he's two coat. And a half i thought he was two and a half inches tall uh again oh two and a half inches tall yep <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> or there's the he's two and a just, half man, or just, you know when you get his rating, like his rating, you know the ladies would rate him. He's like, oh, two and a half man. That's his Bumble profile. That's right, two and a half man. Oh, I like that better. <laughs> two and a half man. Uh, do you did you not know him for Tiger Blood? Oh, Tiger Blood, Tiger Blood. He's got uh, Tiger Blood. He went off the rails for a while. It sounds vaguely familiar, but not. you were probably about maybe nine or ten when it was happening. He was all over the news. Yeah, he had a pretty big meltdown. Um, <laughs> people were making lots of jokes about him, uh, and he was n not really trying to lean into the jokes or anything. He just didn't understand that he was being made a joke. He thought people liked him and that he was cool. And uh, then he started talking about how he had tiger blood and that everything he did was hashtag winning. Hashtag winning. Winning. Constantly. Always ah, winning. Yeah. That's where that came from. <laughs> winning. Pleasant. Oh, God. And all the videos he would post and stuff. See, you know why we didn't bring this up after we watched Hot Shots Part 2? Because th that's the way we want to remember Charlie Sheen, is that kind of era Charlie. Um. Uh, let's see. Um, you either love or you hate. You live in the middle. You get nothing. Charlie Sheen. I would have thought on a shirt. That's our new merch. Number nine. This is uh, from BrainyQuote.com. Uh, you can't process me with a normal brain. <laughs> you can't process meat with a normal me. brain? Oh. I think meat processing would be funnier. You I'm can't sorry, man. Meat. But I've got magic. I got poetry in my fingertips. Most of the time, this includes naps. I'm an F-18, bro, what? and I will destroy you in the air. I will deploy my ordnance to the ground. Why can I see him saying that? <laughs> um, yeah, like even in this movie, you could picture that being a line of his. Yeah. Boom. Crush. Night losers. Winning. Duh. 
What the hell? And that's he's got a carafe of whiskey in one hand and then like a blunt in the other. That's what's <laughs> going number six. On. I'm dealing with fools and trolls and soft targets. It's just strafing runs in my underwear before my first cup of coffee. I don't have time for these clowns. Did Elon Musk say this stuff? Is that <laughs> is this are these is this what happened? Number oh. five. I'm by winning. I win here. I win there. <laughs> I don't think that means what he thinks it means. This sounds like a Dr. Seuss book. I win here. I win there. I win everywhere. Four. The run I was on made Sinatra, Flynn, Jagger, Richards, all of them look like droopy-eyed, armless children. What are you talking about? (laughs) (laughs) Who is even, like, what what odd referencing there? It's, what? It's talking about all the women he banged. Oh. Ah. Like uh, Frank Sinatra. Errol Flynn, Mick Jagger, Keith Richards. He makes them all look like droopy-eyed, armless children. They all needed, like, (laughs) hip replacements, too, so. (laughs) Number three. I have one speed. I have one gear. Go! Oh, you almost sounded like him when you said that. (laughs) I'm different. I have a different constitution. I have a different brain. I have a different heart. I got tiger blood, man. Oh, he does have to. Dying's for fools. Dying's for amateurs. See, and then we found out later on that he has HIV. Mm. So, like, all of this stuff kind of, like, he had to go through all this craziness. And he, I think he knew during this period of time. And I think it, some of it might have sent him off the rails. Yeah. And then he kind of regrouped. He, he did get nicer after this. Number one, Charlie Sheen quote, according to BrainyQuote.com. Life all comes down to a few moments. This is one of them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's not wrong. That's no. I mean, in general terms, <laughs> what happens though if like the person reading that is just sitting on a couch eating a potato? That's like it. that's that that's, that's one of the few moments of well, life. That's one of them. Okay, it came taking a shit. That's one of them. That's one of them. <laughs> Doing your taxes. <clears throat> yeah, that's one of them. Strangling yourself what? while trying to get off. That's one of them. That's one of them. That's been many of them for That's Charlie. Been many of them for Charlie. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you got your Charlie Sheen crash course in there. What do you think? Ah, uh, okay. Um, do no. you feel better knowing who he is or, or what he was about? For Still a while? alive. Still acting somehow. There was a long time where people thought he was going to die for sure. We all thought he was going to die. Like, we thought that every morning on the news cycle, they were going to say he finally. And then he just didn't. And then he just didn't. Hmm. For some reason, he just kept getting up every day winning. You kind of got to admire, like, uh, you know, Martin Sheen and his brother Emilio. Like, they they had to have stepped up, right? Mm-hmm. You got to figure those two probably stepped up. I see that. Yeah, I think. And, and, and Emilio is pretty down to earth. Pretty down to earth. Martin's just... Uh, like a skydiver. Because they uh, come down to earth. You get it? Ah, uh, all brought it back. God, I'm so depressed. <laughs> um, but yeah, Martin Sheen, I could I could really... I could see that. He he seems like he'd be a good dad. Plus, he was the president. Well, in, in a TV show, he wasn't really president. But mm. He was the president. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Terminal Velocity, huh? So the Scout stars Albert uh, Brooks. We're, and we're Brendan not Fraser. nearly done with Terminal Velocity. Oh, we aren't. I, I feel like that was an hour, didn't we? Did we, did we just cover that I, for an hour? I thought we talked. Well, yeah, because we just we just got to the part where with the with the wind turbine. There it is, and then we were good. There it so is. We're done. <gasps> the end. But wait, the do you Scout remember stars- how the? Do you remember how Terminal Velocity ended? Yeah, the guy flew into the wind turbine. And then Charlie Sheen realized he was the Puma Man, and he lifted his girlfriend up in the air above Stonehenge, and they flew away. He flies like a moron? That's right. <laughs> it may have been Puma Man that I just No, there were a group of terrorists who were trying to get a thing, and then they got thing. the thing, and that we're going to use the thing to overthrow Russia and its newly formed democracy. 
Uh, but Char- Charlie Sheen and Natasha Kinski stopped him, and then they got to go to the Kremlin, and they got to reunite the whole family, including her family dog. Remember the dog running up? That uh, was great. The dog had the do- they called him Tripod because he only had three legs. <laughs> How did I remember that? Tripod. I remember that now. And, and like, and she even said, she goes, I know you don't believe me, but I really did have a, a three legged dog. And then when he finally sees it, he's like, Oh, you're you didn't lie. You really had a three legged dog. <laughs> That's so important to the story. Wow! I don't. Know, I think you're. I think we're focusing on the dog and the, not the fact that Charlie Sheen saved Russia. Did he though? <laughs> he did. He like the, they literally gave him a medal and everything. It was like uh, oh, like the end of Star Wars. Really it really was Wars. like the end of Star Wars. Um, because it's such a great movie. Uh, it, yeah. Uh, can we? Okay, since since we're they, talking, they kind of like contrive. Go ahead. No. <laughs> no, you got a point. Go ahead. No, I actually, I really don't. I was just going to comment about the redhead at the end of the movie, but that we couldn't. Stop oh God, it. the redhead guy! Oh my God, I totally forgot. Like a trauma response, it, I just kind of pulled that out, and it's like a this like giant red afro. It, yeah, like we, it, but it wasn't like it was. It was, it was shaped. It was shaped into kind of like a mullet, like like it, when you have like those bonsai trees, and you can kind of create. <laughs> That's what that reminds like like you could tell somebody very meticulously went around the sides. This is this is what Russians do, right? This is what Russians do. And what is so weird is he he smiles through the whole fucking scene. They don't take the camera like the camera loves him. He, I loved him. By the way, he is not a character in this movie. Not at all. No, we never just, hear him speak. Nope. No, he is just at the ceremony with that hair. With an a- it's an afro that somebody like cut around the edges and then let kept the long kept it long in the back and really high on the top. Top, yep, and then uh, like a like kid and play, like that, that kind yeah. of like yeah, but 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 as a white r- orange haired Russian boy, right? <laughs> it was majestic. Like <laughs> and none of us like 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 that that whole scene is happening, and we're all just staring at Opie back here, going, "What the fuck, dude? <laughs> like, how did you get in this movie? What what is happening to you? It is not a good idea to cast your extras this way. It's like, not. No. Like he, the kid is doing nothing, and he's pulling all of the focus of the scene. He's pulling focus from a three-legged dog, three-legged dog called Tripod. Can't even get screen time because we're staring at this fucking guy and this hair. That whole thing about sticking out like a sore thumb, like no fucking kidding. This is worse Literally. than those than those extras who turn and look at the camera. I love those too, like that, but like I was happy for this kid. I'm like, I want. I, I wish the movie would have been about you. I don't, I, you know, just you, just you existing in a world in Russia. If you look like that in Russia, like I could see you in Ireland, but in Russia looking like that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Like, maybe it's because I, I, you know, we're Americans and we suck. But when I think of Russia, I just think of grayness, stillness, sadness. And then you see that kid. And it's like, OK, if that's Russia, I want to go there. I want more of him everywhere. He's not credited. I don't believe he's credited. And I'm trying to find him because this young man deserves to be remembered. Uh, I I should have looked this up earlier. I apologize. I'm doing it now. You guys talk amongst yourself. I'm going to see if I can find Russian kid. Well, I thought about that, too, because it's like, okay, if I could look him up, even if I could just get a still frame of just him at the end of that, I would change our entire Facebook. It would just be constant pictures of that kid. At different angles, you know what we need to we need to find a picture of him and Jurgen. Him and Jurgen. Oh, together. could you imagine him and Jurgen? Jurgen with his arm around him. Oh my yeah. god! Jurgen should have been in this movie. I mean, he could play Russian. Actually, it would have been great if Jurgen would have been in this movie. Just to play off of something good. you said earlier uh, by by him playing on his own by his own rules, the IMDb description agrees with you <gasps> like, because they say he's a maverick, which is exactly mavericks don't play by the rules. They don't. He's a maverick and a former KGB agent team up to stop the Russian mafia from stealing gold. That's he was wait, he was also a former KGB? The kid was, yes. Oh. Yeah. Oh no, Charlie Sheen was. Oh, we've forgotten the fact that there's a character in this movie nicknamed Broken Legs Max. She was my favorite. Because she she had two broken legs <laughs> and worked as a skydiver. But what is cool is is at the end, instead of broken legs, she had yeah, two bro- broken arms. So you could tell that she fucked up again. That's so Max. It's like classic, <laughs> classic, 
classic Max. Yeah. She's a skydiving instructor. Yeah. That doesn't seem like a good thing. She keeps breaking every bone in her body. And not only that, but you know what? She comes into work with a smile on her face every day. You wouldn't even know that she's upset. You would not even know. It's great. She was great. I she always wore a backwards cap, you know, <laughs> which means she's free like a wheeling. proper nineties kid. That's right. That's right. Uh, I'm I'm very proud of her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not going to help me here and keep this going no, while I try know, and find I was the thinking kid. About, like in 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 all of the stuff He's that uncredited. I've been watching lately, he is uncredited. Yeah, they don't, they don't mention him at all. You know what? If anybody listens to this podcast and you know who that redheaded Russian at the end of Terminal Velocity is, get in touch with us. We we need to know you. We need to know. We need to know. I, I want to <laughs> see if he's okay. I want to see what his hair looks like today. Um, I shouldn't assume. I want to I see however this person turned out. That's what I want to see. And I want to get to know that person. And I may want to hug that person. I'm just saying. There's a scene in the movie where, uh, where so the girl gets put into a trunk of a car and the car is taken onto a plane. She just keeps getting thrown in that trunk, too. She gets it like three times. <laughs> <laughs> then the plane is pushed off the, the car is pushed off the plane and Charlie Sheen has to get her out of the car and hold on to her as they, as they uh, do a jump. Because he's got a he's got a parachute. Obviously, she doesn't because she's in a trunk. That's right. In a, in a oh, the car? the car. Remember the car going down? It's like there's no fucking way. And he couldn't get into the the trunk because he didn't have the key, or the key fell, the key dropped. Yeah, the fucking car. I missed this scene. Came out of I the think cargo I was plane. Playing Sims. <laughs> oh. That's yeah, right. that you was were, James uh, Gandolfini's car, by the yeah. way. James Gandolfini, who th- th- this was, this was the the precursor to Soprano's character. Yeah, right here. He plays. A, he he initially g- convinces Charlie Sheen that he's like a an inspector of some yeah. kind, trying he, to shut down. Lawyer. The he's a school. lawyer for the other. And yeah. then, uh, and then he reveals himself to be a Russian gangster. Which at that point, it's funny because then his shirt kind of falls open a little bit. He's got the white tank top and the chain. <laughs> he becomes a he becomes a Russian gangster. It's true. It's true. <laughs> so this, yeah, this was definitely the the beginnings of of him studying for Actually, Tony no, Soprano. Sorry, it was it was it was uh, Christopher McDonald's car. James Gandolfini was the big bad. I forgot about and Christopher McDonald's hair was a star. Bleach in this movie. blonde, and it looked like ramen noodles. Like it was like perfect. Maybe like, he uh, gave birth to the Russian kid at the oh, end. Oh, I bet they're related. I mean, maybe maybe he got him the job. They had wild hair. Christopher McDonald should not uh, dye his hair. He. Not I bet blonde. it he's, all fell he's out. He's not a blonde. No, he doesn't. It, it's not good for his coloring. He's an autumn. Um, but like even like the finger waves all over his his hair. You you can tell like, if you tapped it, it would be like um, creme brulee. You know. I was watching. I was watching one one, one of the favorite YouTubers out there. I can't remember. It was either. That's why they're your the favorite. It was either Curtis or Charlie. Uh, Moist critical said, "Okay, but why are you blonde?" <laughs> that's a great question that's a great question yeah god that's weird i know it has nothing to do with it but it is 90s if i bring up the fact that when brad pitt and jennifer aniston broke up and then he went and dyed his hair bleach blonde and then jennifer went on was it leno or some show and she He's like, how are you doing? She's like, great. And then said something about Brad. And she goes, yeah, hey, um, Billy Idol called. He wants his hair back. And I thought that was the greatest little comeback. I'm like, oh, shit. (laughs) Go. It's like when Nicole Kidman, after her and Tom Cruise got divorced, they're like, "How? you know, what do you think you can? I mean, life's going to be different for you now. She's like, yeah, I can finally wear high heels again. Oh. (laughs) Little short man, tell me. Uh, Makes me want to look up Denise Richards' quotes about Charlie Sheen. Oh, my God. (laughs) Yeah, I think that was more, like, contentious in in the court of law kind Uh, of stuff that she had to say, for sure. Not good. Not good. Not good. Not good. Isn't she on one of those reality shows now? Yeah. Like, Housewives of Somewhere? They, they, they... They buy up all the Botox and then they just get like a, an immediate pass onto one of those shows. It's like, you look like a balloon. Let's get you on Real Housewives of Scott County. 
make it happen. Okay, no, let's let's be careful here. We're verging on bringing back the substance for me, and I'm not. I'm not. Um, uh, I'm still not recovered. I watched a movie called The Substance. That's going to be on the main show okay. with uh, me and Jeff, maybe Bob, maybe joining us for that one. Um, it's directed by Carly Fergett, uh, and it's about uh, Demi Moore as an aging actress who uh, being pushed out of her job. She's now a fit- she's moved from being an Academy Award winning actress to being a fitness influencer, but she's in her mid fifties. So Dennis Quaid, who's a you know, sleazy producer, is pushing her out of her job. Like he fires her without even firing her because he wants to get somebody younger and bring her in. Uh, after an accident, Demi Moore uh, finds out about this thing called the substance, which she can take. And if she takes it, she can create a younger, better version of herself that emerges from her back. Like her back slices open and Margaret Qualley crawls out completely nude and is a younger, better version of Demi Moore. And then she has to sew up Demi Moore's back and close it and then put her on a substance for seven days. Before they have to switch back, they have to switch bodies back, uh, and and so they do. And then Demi Moore is alive for seven days, and she's be in a closet, you know, being fed by the stuff. And then, uh, then when uh, Margaret Qualley comes back, she doesn't want to go back in the closet again. She wants to stay out and be a star because she's got the show now. She took Demi Moore's place in the show, but they're the same person. Yeah, same DNA, same everything. But uh, they're having these sort of different experiences, obviously, because, you know, one's alive seven days and the other one's alive seven days. But if you wait more than seven days to switch back, bad things start to happen. Oh, bad things really start to happen. Bad, bad things starting to happen that huh. that left me. I'm not kidding. I, w- I had to ask. I almost asked Jeff, our, our co-host on the regular show, to. He was at the movie as well. I nearly asked him to follow me home to make sure I got there. OK, <laughs> when I got home. He comes into my room and he's like, I need to trauma dump. Can you come out to the living room and tells me the entire story of the movie? I never want to see this film. Like, I never. You never, never see this movie. Probably would be a horrible idea. I get I'm paranoid enough as it is. There is a scene. She, She turns food into into horror. And there's a scene in the movie where Dennis Quaid is eating shrimp and it's just this close up of his face covered in like shrimp stuff and he's spitting everywhere and it's just mouth noises as loud as possible into the microphone. Just mouth noises as he talks. Because it's horror. It's horror. (laughs) And it's effective. But like for your... It's effective. Like the way that you are with, with noises and shit. Yeah, this is not the movie for you. Absolutely not. It gets so much worse than that, though. We can't. We won't ever tell you about no, boobs. No, because I don't want to remember it. Till yeah. I got. I have to remember it one more time for Tuesday. Oh, but not even kidding. I had to watch The Wizard of Oz, and yeah. then yesterday I watched. I, I watched Nashville, Taxi Driver, and Raging Bull in a row, just so I could reach a place where I could watch a regular movie again, like we watched today. Because otherwise, I'm not sure if I would have recovered enough. From the substance. We literally had to watch Wizard of Oz that night. Which, by the way, was beautiful. It was Isn't gorgeous. that a great transfer? Oh, I Thank loved God. it. Love it. Yeah. So glad that's streaming for people to see. Yep. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll, I will be li- reliving that experience one last time on the on the regular show, uh, which will be on the feed uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday. Which, when you do something like that, doesn't it put what we do into perspective? Like, nothing is bad. Nothing is sacred. Nothing is anything. Here's the thing, though. And I was telling this to MJ earlier. The Substance is the best movie of 2024. Yeah. It's one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. And right. I will never watch this movie again in my life. Yep. In my life. It literally rivals Midsummer and Everything Everywhere All at Once, the two greatest movies ever made for me. And I would say it also rivals uh, The Big Lebowski. <gasps> It, I mean, I'm serious. Like everything, everywhere. Number one. Yeah. Midsummer. Number two. Then it's the substance and the Big Lebowski. Casablanca. Yeah. The Wizard of Oz. Skydivers. Legally Blonde. Terminal Velocity. I'm not joking about Legally Blonde. Uh, I, know. I, ne- I never joke about Legally Blonde. That movie is incredible. And if you've never seen Legally Blonde, what is wrong with you? I haven't most, seen that actually. It's the happiest movie ever made. You haven't seen it? You. It is you'd pure like it. joy. It is like. It- Sunshine. Sunshine everywhere. Just okay. beautiful. Yeah. It's a happy movie. Like the Scout. Like the Scout. 
starring Albert Brooks as the scout. <laughs> 1994 in September is pretty slim pickings. It's true. That's how you end up with uh, time fop or top, time, time cop. Time Sorry, time cop. cop. See, it's still, you know what? I I need to go back to this because we really did have fun with time fop, time cop. But when you look up the word fop, it you it usually says, please cut that out. The berries and cream guy is a fop, right? <clears throat> yeah. Berries and cream. Berries and cream. But <laughs> not only is it, I mean, like, yes, they're foppish. And yes, that means they're dandy. But did you know that there's a difference between fop and dandy? I have, I had no idea. Is there a time dandy? Well, there could be. I think we have to think about it. So a fop chooses the power of perfume over personal hygiene any day, covers damage with wigs and makeup, dresses in unicorn vomit, and begins every morning by rolling in glue, pearls, and glitter. That's what a fop does. Now a dandy, <clears throat> slightly different, bathes until he cries, has human skin and hair, unlike a fop, I guess, <laughs> prefers quality over variation, spends seven hours on the perfect tie knot, owns 829 white silk ties, and dies of starvation. That's what a dandy does. So I just thought, I found that on Pinterest, and I, I thought I'd want to share because we were definitely putting fop and dandy together. But ultimately, they're similar. They're similar. They're, they're, they're opposites that, who attract. Absolutely. I'm, I'm sure a dandy would date a fop. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think ultimately, if you're going to go to a party and you know that there'll be a fop and a dandy, they're probably going to be in the same clique. Probably. Yeah. Hmm. And probably both die of starvation because it was, you know... But the time fop will not save anyone. He's not going to end up saving no, he's anyone. He's going to save himself before, oh, before he saves anyone. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, the time fop. He is not in uh, The Scout, which is a baseball movie starring Albert Brooks and Brendan Fraser from 1994, in which uh, 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 Brendan Fraser plays a, a superstar pitcher by the name of Jim California. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no. No, it's uh it's Brendan Maryland. No. Don't make me say it. It's uh Don't make me say it. What did you say? Jerry Iowa? Jerry Iowa. Oh, Jerry Iowa. <laughs> it's Frankie Florida. No fuck. <laughs> Steve. Mm. Steve Hawaii. Steve Nebraska. His <laughs> name is Steve Nebraska. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> no, oh, it's it. not Steve North Dakota. <laughs> Dave Montana. It's not Billy Arkansas. <laughs> oh. Steve Nebraska. A, I hate the name Steve. And two, no. Well, for personal reasons. <laughs> You're all fine if your name is Steve. But uh, Steve Nebraska. Nebraska. Like, honestly, there are other states other states that yeah. would probably make a better last name, like like Steve Maine. I, I don't know why you want to get. I don't know if we want to get into this yet, but I'm. I was relatively baffled by the fact that they didn't reveal that's a fake name because obviously, you're no one is named Steve Nebraska, and obviously this is a, the the whole premise of the rest of the movie after he gets discovered is that that he's going through therapy to recover his personality, recover who he was. Mm -hmm. That led him to be in Mexico for so long. And we never get that. No, <laughs> he yeah. never gets to that. They never reveal anything about him. The whole thing about even introducing Diane Weist as the doctor. Yeah. Totally pay does not pay off. Does anyway. not pay off whatsoever. So like our whole thing is like, oh, OK, so I bet we're going to see that this name was something that he like 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 maybe Brendan Fraser's character had abandonment issues he chose a name that was so random because he didn't want his father's last name like we we really thought that was going to come up again and it fucking didn't so yeah <laughs> well see i had a weird theory that they were that people were like oh americans are stupid let's just put two stupid american things together steve nebraska <laughs> it's like a dopey screenwriter pitching this movie and he's just like looking around somebody's office trying to figure uh the character's name is uh steve steve <laughs> they saw a poster of steve mcqueen on the wall oh. and then a, a poster for for uh, uh the guy he sees the guy's got a mug that says nebraska steve ne steve 
Nebraska. Nebraska. His yep. name is Steve Nebraska. He's the greatest baseball player. He throws 109 miles per hour. Yeah. And he hits. He's a switch hitter who hits home runs every time. All right. Here's $20 million Pretty, to make yeah. your movie. I just, Literal I, budget <laughs> for this movie, $20 million, by the way. Did it mostly go to... Brandon George Fraser? Steinbrenner, yes. Oh, George um, he is in the movie. <laughs> Not just the voice from Seinfeld, the actual George Steinbrenner. I would have preferred the voice from Seinfeld, actually. <laughs> so, uh, Albert Brooks is a, is a Percolo, Al Percolo. He's a baseball scout. He, he did, goes to some Midwestern school and he finds this kid uh, who's going to be this great pitcher. Uh, who is Michael it? Rappaport. Michael Rappaport. Uh, uh, with a really bad wig. <laughs> and uh, he convinces his parents, who are so strict and Christian and want their son to go to college, he convinces them to let him go play for the Yankees. Now, and this this is not how baseball works at all. Uh, maybe in the 1950s, you can you, maybe you can find an example, or or the 40s, or a kid just went from the farm to pitching in Yankee Stadium. But in the 1990s, this is not a thing. This doesn't exist. He he gets picked off the 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 high school team and and signed and sent to New York and he goes to pitch in his very first game the very first game the he opener pitch, the, the season the opener. season opener for the Yankees who have never se- who somehow have never seen this person that they've given multiple millions of dollars to to be their new star pitcher they've never seen him yep that they just trust their scout so much that they're going to have this kid throw throw opening day for at Yankee Stadium. Without having ever seen him, without him ever having met the pitching coach, the rest of the team. Uh, it <laughs> all makes sense. It all makes sense. He doesn't even warm up. Doesn't even really make it to the field, does he? Because he ended up just kind of running away before the game starts and just is running down the turnpike. Well, no, actually, he does make it on the field. Then he vomits on the field, runs into the turnpike. You were watching the movie. I was watching that. this one. I was too. I was that was too. a test. Yeah. Just to see if you would jump in on that. <laughs> you know, and again, let's just say it from the outset. I love Al- Albert Brooks. I love Brendan Fraser. I, I'm you know hit or miss with everybody else that was in this movie, but ultimately, oh, Lane Smith is the, as his boss. Oh, is that who that was? Mm-hmm. Oh, you know what? He's in every movie, and every movie I, I, I never liked his character in. He's always a villain of some sort. Like my, his most famous role is my cousin Vinny. He was the uh, opposing the lawyer. That's and right. My cousin Vinny. He just he he seems like he's going to be like that veteran cop who has to yell at the younger cops to do their job. That's what he always. Seems I always like. thought of him more like the the mayor from Jaws who refuses to close the beach even though there's a shark killing people. You gotta, you gotta make money. He's got to. He's got an energy like he that. Have, he's got a yeah. jaw. Jo- he's got mayor from Jaws energy. He has that smile that is like. It's all teeth. It's really big teeth. That's what I take away. From. He's not good at his job because he lets a pitcher who he's never seen before pitch opening day for the New York Yankees. Well, okay, but again. <laughs> he's very, he's the general manager of the Yankees. He's not good at his job because he lets people, he lets people pitch on the Yankees who've never stepped into Yankee Stadium before. He's like, hey, kid, get up on the mound and go throw them to the Yankees. For the Yankees. Well, and then what? What really is the job of a of a scout? Because so the scout in the beginning, like you see, like five or six of them, I guess, all chit chatting about the biz, right? Um, don't they have jobs? Like you their, know, their job is to watch baseball and find kids who are really good at baseball, and then recommend them to the team to. Uh, so they're just sitting there. They sit there. They make a judgment. They're usually ex-ball players who can see when somebody's got some skill. And then they'll recommend that the Major League Baseball team take a look at them. And that's where the scout's job ends. <laughs> Generally it. speaking, they'll make the recommendation. The team will take over after that and start training the guy to become a Major League Baseball player. So Al Al gets this player who fails miserably, <laughs> throws up on the mound, and runs away. Uh, he gets busted down to Mexico like a <laughs> like a cop getting busted down to beat cop. <laughs> 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 His boss, instead of firing him, sends him deep into Mexico, where he stumbles upon the only other white person, uh, <laughs> Steve Nebraska. Steve Nebraska, the, be- the beloved Steve Nebraska, the beloved uh, Mike Illinois. Tim Vermont. 
who is uh he throws a he throws 109 miles per hour and uh knocks over the catcher every time he throws a pitch and uh you can hit uh, from both sides of the plate which is not something most people can do and he hits home runs every time but what we never understand is why the fuck was he in mexico to begin right. with yeah what what was his whole deal about about getting free tacos yeah because well, he's such a great baseball player that they never let him pay his bill. He just gets free tacos. But why was he in Mexico? Well, that's what Diane Weist is supposed to be finding out, but we'll never know. She never told us. No. Oh. She just sort of fucks off on the movie. Just you know, kind of leaves at one point. Yeah. Well, maybe she just did a favor to Mike Ritchie because, you know, she's like, well, you fucked me on Cops and Robbers. <laughs> I will come out and do this stupid fucking movie, but I swear to God, if it goes one way, I'm out. I'm out. This is the director of Cops and Robbers. Right. It's also the director of The Island with Michael Caine, one of the all-time great uh, failures. He was also the director of Bad News Bears. Both and Bad News, both Bad News Bears movies Are in the you 1970s. serious? He did the 70s and the... Wow. Not, not the right. No, the new one was uh, was a different director. He did the two in the seventies. Oh. He did the uh, the original and the sequel. The original and the sequel. The sequel where they played at the Astrodome. Oh, or was that the original? I don't remember. They played I, at the Astrodome at some point. I, you know what? I never cared. I don't know if he. I don't know if he went to Japan with them. I, I think that's a third movie. I might be misremembering the Bad News Bears. I, I don't remember. There's a lot of Bad all. News Bears lore. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to always just say, oh, that's bad news bears. I used to always say that. And then I heard somebody else say it recently. I'm like, oh, was that a thing? I thought I I thought I was original, but I'm I'm not. I'm not. I have to pee. Well, there's a lot of the so the bad news bears is a very common sports reference because they're the it's they, that's where the trope originated about the team that's uh not any good who get an inspirational coach and they become good. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did not know what that was. Yeah. Um, but you're familiar with the trope, though. Uh, I've heard it. I haven't heard what it is or what it was about until now. <laughs> hmm. You've never heard. Have you heard references to Bad News Bears? I've just I just heard Bad News Bears. I ha- I didn't know where it came from. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you just assumed it was lit- just the alliteration. I'm, I'm like, I don't. Yeah, just so, it's just there. I don't know. Where <laughs> it, I never used it because I'm like, I don't know what it's from. <laughs> <laughs> It's when something is bad and then it gets an inspirational makeover and it becomes good. Oh. That's Bad News Bears. Where did the bears come in? The team name was the bears. Oh, so, it, but then that doesn't. They okay. were the bears sponsored by Jerry's Bail Bonds. <laughs> <laughs> they they turned their season around with their inspirational coach uh, played by uh, Walter Matthau. Who uh, drink? Who gets drunk during games and yells at them and makes them better ball players? Delightful! Yeah. Wow, that sounds <laughs> great. <laughs> Go he lets sports. A, he lets a girl pitch. There's yeah. a girl on the team. Okay. That was a that was new for the time. Yeah. And she's the best player on the team. It makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Doesn't sound horrible. Yeah. Maybe. I don't like sports. So I have no, I've never <laughs> liked sports. I my favorite game was or my favorite sort of sports game was medicine ball because I had I got to ride around on one of those rolly thingies. But any other sport in school, nope, not touching it. So you always took off PE. I don't. I don't like. I never liked PE. I didn't. I, eh, yeah. Sports, man. Sports. Sports. I used to hide in the bathroom in the junior high, so I didn't have to do it. I I used to hide in the bathroom at the high school. Yeah. But that wasn't because I didn't want to do it. That was because my boyfriend was flirting with his ex-girlfriend. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember all that. Oh, let's trauma dump. Tell me more. That's horrible. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Oh, you know, oh, well, he probably sucks now. I think he's working at a McDonald's. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Nothing against you people who do work at McDonald's. But... No, but he sucks for... <laughs> yeah, yeah, he just sucks. So it's... Yeah. There it is. 
So, uh, yeah, he, he finds Steve Nebraska. He brings him back and, uh, Steve, uh, pitches for the scouts and, uh, they're going to, you know, after the Yankees. So he, Lane Smith takes the time to then fire Brooks's character for no good reason. Yeah, I remember he got, he got fired. Like, yeah. Why didn't you just fire him before you sent him to Mexico? Right. Like, yeah, if you were going to fire him anyway, did, maybe he just wanted to like screw with him. Like, go to Mexico. You're fired. <laughs> right? It's like in Mexico, dude. <laughs> so yeah, he's yeah. just being super petty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when 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 in reality, it's like you <laughs> got all the best food down there, and yeah. like it's awesome in Mexico. So you didn't really harm me in the end. I was having a great I mean, time. If I had to go to, I mean, I I would love to eat the food and hang out down there, but um, I would not like to go to a bunch of random baseball games because I have no interest in that. So that. Games played in the rain. Be a whammy on me. Yeah. Games played with, with other people, but on me. Yeah. Games yeah. played with goats in the outfield, <gasps> eating the grass. Uh, when the guy was like eating the foot of an animal. Yeah, it was like a goat's hoof. Could Still be. had the hoof on it. Yeah. Which could have been delicious. We don't know. Could have been. And and again. So strange. It's Mexico. It probably tastes awesome. So <laughs> I don't know. Well, they know how to flavor things, so... Mexican food is the greatest food of all time. I'm sorry. I've said it. There's no other comment to be made. Yeah. It, that's the end. The end. I, I, you know what? I would have stayed in Mexico for the rest of the movie. That's that's it. See, I'm partial to Italian, but um, I'm just really into pasta. You are. You love carbs. I do. It's true. I really do. So, Steve Nebraska... Uh, he comes back and he signs a contract with the Yankees. But uh, Albert Brooks early in the movie introduces uh, the the concept of King Kong, which continues to be it's a running motif. It's yeah. a runner in the scout. Uh, yeah, but but it doesn't feel like a genuine runner. Like anytime it's called back, it feels disingenuous. I I I don't I don't feel it, connected to it. it. It definitely feels like a screenwriting invention, yeah. but I think it's a screenwriting invention that Albert Brooks came up with he did get a credit on the screenplay for this he did do a a pass on it and i think he was trying to bring something to the movie that wasn't there like thematically i think that's fair and i you know he took a risk he took a swing with uh king kong and i i think the way it's directed it definitely feels like uh something that was tacked on yeah uh i don't think michael rich i don't think michael richie was committed to the, the to the motif but uh brooks made it a motif and to his credit, he was selling the King Kong thing throughout. I get it, you know, but it still felt shoehorned into there. Like anytime he could bring up the Kong reference, it was like, yeah, but I, I just it didn't feel like that was the moment for me. I don't know. I, 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 I love Brooks. He can sell me anything, but I just didn't feel connected to that Kong thing. Because it's because King Kong, what is the relationship that King Kong has to baseball? Also, King Kong uh, is not not a good thing that happens. Like it's all a bad thing that happened. Uh, guy went the guy who went and found King Kong was a bastard. Yeah, <laughs> who took something out of its uh, native native habitat and placed it something else, which doesn't apply to Brendan Fraser because he's not native to Mexico. Right. So this is not. Uh, I know he's a, he is a fish out of water. Yes, but he is not native to Mexico. No, he didn't need to go to Mexico to find it. Right. Again, why was he in Mexico? Like that'll be the question of the ages for me. Yeah, why did he? Th- why did he choose Mexico over like other places? I have to wonder. Like deleted scenes. Was there a whole moment where he's talking to Diane Weiss and she's like, "All right, why did you end up in Mexico?" And sadly, a- sadly, the whole reason that he was in Mexico is that this character was written as Mexican, and they didn't bother to update that. That's. I mean, I, I'm just I'm only speculating, but I think they just didn't they just didn't bother to update the and also like they had this whole idea about uh, sending Al somewhere where he would be miserable as if we would, you know, sending him to Mexico lets us know that this is not a place that this guy wants to be. So, well, I mean, let's face it, that this movie had many moments of. Racism. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a, it is a it is very much one of those. Very racist, unintentionally racist movies. Yeah. So many just stereotypical mm-hmm. yeah. shit. I mean, you, you, you're going to hear the, you hear mariachis. Yeah. Uh, you hear uh, the hat dance thing. You hear all that. that n- and not to, to. The guy eating the, the leg, obviously. Yeah. It's a very. <laughs> yeah. The, the, you know, the Tony Bennett show and there's an Asian man 
sitting there and looks at Albert Brooks and he's like, you don't understand a word of this. And he's like, nope. And he's like, good. And it's just like, okay, why are you there? You know, I mean, and, and nothing just sat right with me with that. With that, it was icky. Yeah. It was icky. Yeah. The movie doesn't go, doesn't have a bad intention in any no. way, but it's just something that lazy screenwriting can do is just ro- fall on hacky cliches and simplicities. Or as mom would say, you know what? It was a different time. Uh, it was a different time. So fuck your different <laughs> Not you, mom. We're different <laughs> I'm saying you were wrong. Sometimes and I'm like, it's different yeah. time. Well, now it's a different, it's a different time now. So well, it's always going to be a different time. Technically, it's a different time right now. Right now. <laughs> so why, well, you can't keep making excuses for stupid behavior. Right. You know, it's like, it. okay, hey, fine. It was a different I, time. But I, it, like, as a, as a per- I don't feel like I need to tell anybody that uh, marrying a 14 year old girl is not okay. Yeah. But somehow people look at that from like years ago and go, it was a different time. You know, like the Jerry Lee Lewis, like <laughs> they look back on it, or when Elvis met Priscilla and they're just you know, 15 years old. Or Can I interject? Jake LaMotta. <laughs> I need to interject. Huh? I just heard a story about <laughs> fucking. Aerosmith front man. Oh, God. Oh, God. Why isn't his name coming to my head? Steven Tyler. Steven fucking Tyler. Well, there's, yeah. Okay. Apparently, in the 70s, he looks like your great Aunt Linda, like who's an art teacher now. That's what he looks like. Okay. Um, he actually met a, a, a young girl who was underage okay went to went through the steps of adopting her so he could take her on tour with them he wasn't her dad they weren't doing dad and daughter things Uh, how old was this child 14 15 Uh maybe even 16 still under the age of consent Uh but yeah and back then, it didn't matter because it was it was a different time. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, Woody Allen was his was his wife's you know adopted father. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, he would take her to piano lessons, <laughs> and then take her home, give her love lessons. Mm. Mm. Ah, yeah. I don't need to tell you. I shouldn't need to tell an adult that's not okay. But apparently, there's a a large portion of the population that's voting for Donald Trump that feels this is the perfectly, why is that not normal? I don't understand. Uh, it's a different time. It's I'm not. A different time. Hey, you can say that. I'm, I do make political statements and I am left wing, but um, it is your side. Yeah. That says that there shouldn't be an age of consent. No one on our side saying that. No. There, no one. No one on our side says that we should get rid of the age of consent. <laughs> but on your side. They do say that. Yeah. They say it a lot. Yeah. They say it in public. You also hate that yeah. women have rights and we wanted bodily autonomy, but you took mm. that away. So, I mean, you're getting your way. Uh. It was a different time. Yeah. Oh, a different time. How many years ago? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and what they want is that different time to come back so they can justify every shitty decision <sighs> and choice that they, they make. So that's fine. That's fine. Uh-uh. I'm not bitter. Mm-hmm. We're not going back. Not going as, back. As Kamala said. Yeah, we're not. <laughs> God bless. Oh, darn. Somebody's mad and turned off the podcast and is probably going to social. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. It's the end of the goddamn world. I mean, it sucks that you're listening to this one because it's kind of low energy today. But like that, <laughs> I mean, go pick out another one. You're going to yeah, hear it. Bye. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Uh, bye-bye. Uh, bye-bye. We're, we're still better than me. <laughs> You know what? Just what I said just then. That was a different time, wasn't it? Uh, it was. Oh, wow. It was just a minute ago. Well, what was it that Charlie Sheen said? It was a different time. <laughs> and uh, I've got tiger's blood. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm gonna. I, Charlie Sheen. He put it best earlier in the show when he was talking, uh, when he spoke. Uh, yeah. On his on his great quote, "Life comes down to a few moments. This is one of them. This is one of them." <laughs> This is, you know what? This is a moment He's of so life. right. He's so right. Like, I never put it in that perspective before. <laughs> what was the line? There was a line in this movie that you guys wrote down. What was it? Do you remember? 
fuck. Mm, um, and it was because we it both was, just kept it, it. It was so funny. Yes. Um, was, was there, no, because there was a couple, but one of them was. Um, I know you looked at MJ and said, write that down. <laughs> That was that was what it was. It was super short, and it was of course, and it was Brendan Fraser because he had some really just funny, off the wall lines. One of them was, um, uh, wait, I I don't want to do this. That, oh, that, there was that one. Fuck, now I can't remember it because I'm not going to do it justice. We should have written this stuff down. God damn it! But everything he said w- was just perfect. Like the way that that MJ and I talked to each other. That's the way we want to be able to talk to each other is just to say something so off the wall, but like, but like so honest. Like he's like, um, this isn't fun. I mean, I'm not. I, I'm I don't not, want to do this anymore. This isn't fun. And this is like straight up like a line that we like had just. And the way he said it was just so, like, uh, like, like. Well, all of his line reads are pretty sincere. They're yeah. super sincere. They're naive. They're 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 That's just the thing. You know, let's let's break down this character because like he was in Mexico, he becomes this great major league he becomes this he's been this ba- baseball player for a while, I guess. Yeah. We don't know how old he is. We never learn that. Um we never learn anything about him, even though the whole movie is setting up this central mystery about Steve. So uh the, he he has this big meltdown during the uh introductory press conference, which again is another callback to King Kong, because he's the gorilla and uh the gorilla gets freaked out by Flash bulbs. Right. Brendan Fraser's getting his picture taken at a press conference and freaking out and losing it. And uh, uh, so they, the Yankees add to his contract that he's got to get uh, therapy. He's got to go to therapy and be certified that he can, you know, he's not going to lose his shit while right. he's on the mound. Right. So uh, Albert Brooks, Al, he he uh, finds a finds a, a psychiatrist in the, in the yellow pages and he chooses her because her name is H. Aaron. Because that's another baseball reference. Hank Aaron is the one of the all-time great baseball players. Mm-hmm. So her name is H. Aaron. So that's why he chooses her. But she's kind of very serious about her job. Yeah. You even said this. Like, you you work in a related field. And <laughs> and you even said, like, she's got she, – like, she she's taking this very seriously. Yes. <laughs> yeah. she's, she, she, it appears like, she, like Diane Weiss took time to invest in becoming a psychiatrist. Well, that's it's funny because, like, you know, I was reading that royalsreview.com. It's a Kansas City Royals. They were talking about this movie. And I thought that was it was kind of funny because one of the lines where they they said, um, all you need to know is this movie, while charming and fun, in a lot of ways, has no idea how the sport of baseball or even reality works. That that was the one <laughs> line that I thought that was great. Um, but I was just reading this, too. And, and it's funny that you brought that up because they were talking about Diane Wee's character. and. There's a thing, you know, especially when you work with people who um, have experienced trauma or mental or physical and intellectual disabilities, things like that. There is a thing called the HIPAA law. You are not allowed to share any of the information of the client you are working with to anyone. So as as saying, you know, like, yeah, like she did that really well. Having said that, though, and I'm reading this, I'm like, this is true. Albert Brooks' character asks about... Steve Nebraska is like, hey, did you figure out what's wrong with him? <laughs> and she broke the HIPAA law by saying he was abused by his father. You don't share that. Yes, which is a thing. But I mean, you never know. Th- or like, I'm. <laughs> I don't think that they would have thought of this. Um, they could get around it with saying he signed a piece of paperwork that says that he c- that she can communicate with him because he's like a guardian of sorts right well that's completely different but even having said that it's it's client um you know doctor client privilege privilege and the only way that you could get information like that yeah that would be you would you would have to have something but she already knew he was just a, a scout that brought him there she already right, but, knew that well but but she actually makes an observation about that that he she says he sees you like a father figure and he's like oh that's great a father he might want to stab yeah exactly <laughs> it still does not get around hipaa you, you she still violated hipaa on that i know i've been in this for over a decade so <laughs> that pissed me off that was like yeah that that that's not true to form but Whatever, but she's like so that they set her up like a real character. They really did, and actually, this the some of the 
the pictures that she would show him, you could, I, I liked how he played through the trauma because he, I believed him. He was looking at these pictures and he, she's asking him to describe what he sees in these pictures. And some of them are just, they're, they're so real to him. He, he can actually look at a picture and, and give a whole scene of what that meant. That actually made me tear up. I'm like, oh my God. And then you get to the most basic picture at the end. It's a dad and son fishing. And he's like, oh yeah, they're just fishing. Just fishing like he's there's so much pain that he's stuffed down and i thought she and he did that beautifully like i would have rather had a movie about a doctor and a client like this and see where that would have went like it would be a lot more dramatic obviously and not but like i would have rather seen well they, they make the mistake of us of thinking that that al's the main character here yeah. and al is like it, it's it's out of balance because al is not the main character right. he is not on any kind of journey at all. Like I think like I mentioned going back to the King Kong thing, like I, I'm sure that was added by by Brooks. Mm-hmm. And to because he's looking at his character and seeing how thin and needless that his role really is. Mm-hmm. All he needs to do is deliver uh Steve Nebraska to the Yankees. And then you know you, you put it with Diane Weist, and that's a whole that's the rest of the, the movie that it, they think they're making. Yeah. But uh he's then off on the other side just making this whole other movie about a hustler who's you know trying to stay in the game using this kid and be- becoming a better person through uh being like a father to this kid. Only he doesn't really do that. Yeah. <laughs> Until like the very last minute of the movie where he's like, okay, you don't have to pitch. And he's like, I don't? And you're like, nah. Okay, I think I'm going to pitch. Okay, then you can go pitch. And then we'll do laundry. Because that was a through line that we created was you liking laundry. Well, like that, you're fucking Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory. What is what is weird, too, is that, like, they... Oh. They kind of they, they kind of fleshed out Brennan Fraser. I, I liked the, the, the little tidbits of what we got to know about him as a person. I liked, I liked that. Again, I wanted more of that. But then we don't really get enough like talking about the laundry and that you know he's like yeah I, I like laundry makes me makes me feel calm it relaxes me and 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 stuff like that like these little details about humans that so many people don't pay attention to um i i like those little moments and he was so sincere my like, god i love brendan i just do and he was so sincere in these little moments in the film i just think that could have been done he deserved better that's just how i see it as a character. He does that with these characters. Mm-hmm. He did this in, in Encino Man, which is such a, like, I think with a, the way that movie was written, it was not, there was not supposed to be any depth to that character. Yeah. And he was like inventing it as he went on. Yeah. Like you can sense the the invention in every moment yeah. that Brendan's there. Because I don't think any of that is in the screenplay. I don't think anything in like that is in the movie. The movie thinks it's about Sean Astin's character. Right, right. And it's supposed to be. But he's like not giving you anything. Whereas Brendan Fraser is giving you nonstop energy. But in a very positive, like charismatic, welcoming mm-hmm. sort of way. Like that character in any other family movie is the most obnoxious character in the world the, the, where they mistake like big overt gesturing as as acting and fraser like invests that character with childlike glee yep and uh, it just it keeps so coming beautifully. like and see man's not a good movie it's terrible but like <laughs> it's a poly shore vehicle That's he's a it. caveman who gets unfrozen in modern day Los Angeles mm-hmm. and goes on an mm-hmm. adventure with Polly Shore and Sean Astin. He, he, he goes to high school because he's never he's a caveman in high school. He was a fish out of water, as you oh, might yeah. say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, people keep digging these fish out of water. I don't <laughs> Put know the fucking back in the water. You know, I'd like to see Can't a, breathe. <laughs> a fish out of water that doesn't play by the rules. That's what I'd like to he's see. A, he's a maverick he's fish. He's a maverick out. fish out of water. He's a dead fish out of water. Fish can't breathe. <laughs> That's why he doesn't play by the rules. I if he plays like, by the rules, it's like when people water. say, It's like when people say, I, we got to get you out of your comfort zone. I'm like, why would I want to leave my comfort zone? Uh, like, I'm for, that's, Comfort is literally in the name. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna create a new comfort zone. No thank you. <laughs> I mean, I get it. It's it's it, you know changing, evolving, that kind of thing. But when there's blankets in my comfort zone, <laughs> maybe food. I'm not oh, going anywhere. Food. I'm not. I'm not I'm going not anywhere. <laughs> How do we get to comfort zone? <laughs> From fish out of water. Oh, fish out. Of, yeah. You got to put the fish, fish back in the water. Like, 
water. They, they kind of need it to yeah, live. Yeah, except for the maverick fish and I kinda that need, just fuck I, off. I kind of need comfort to live. Uh, <laughs> you know what? But think about it. Isn't it weird? Like, fish don't go to bed. Like, they don't have little blankets and their little fish beds. No. Like, they just kind of float. But you know what? I would find that very... Com- I love water. I love being in water. Uh, I would love sleeping in water if I could. I literally, I told my friend the other day, I was like, I would love to just be a fish. I would love to be a fish. And she was like, why would you want to be a fish? And I'm like... Amy, just- the incredible Mr. MJ. <gasps> oh... Oh, we're sorry. You're Don Knotts now. You need to see. No, you don't. You need to no, see the incredible Mr. Do Limpet. That. But that's true. If you want to be a fish, we want that for Actually, you. Actually, have you ever thought about sensory deprivation? You nope. can enjoy that. Don't do it. I've thought of it. I, I, why? It's just floating in water and thinking. Yes. So not that. It's, it's so much more than that. I saw Ryan Trahan's video on it. He loved it. Some people really like it. Some people hate it. Imagine meditation with actual with literally nothing you can't see anything you can't hear anything the darkness is swallowing you whole no music no anything it's the most terrifying feeling you'll ever have aside from being in the womb most terrifying feeling she'll ever have see? i've never been done it <laughs> I, I would i think i, I would actually find it. it comforting because my thoughts are so loud and then once you add other outside stimuli to that it's a lot See, I think I just walk around in sensory deprivation, so I already feel like there's a a chasm around me, swallowing me whole. I'm so that sad today. That terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't, I mean, essentially, you're talking to me. I don't know shit about shit, so <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Anyway, I didn't hate the movie. It was all right. I didn't love it. There's, a, there's several things that are wrong with it. Like, we never get to what, like, they seem to set up the mystery of Steve Nebraska's, like, uh, character. Like, they're going to reveal something about him. And then they just never, they never get there. They never do it. Yeah. Thoughts? Um, no. No, they never get there. They they never, like, it feels like they, they stopped in the middle of the movie, took a lunch and said, yeah, you know what? We'll finish this later. <laughs> <laughs> we're just going to jump to the end. Just jump to uh, the end. We're going to skip know? all that all the character development that you've been doing. We're going to blow that out. And, uh... do, we have, do we have time to... Fi- you know what? I don't even think we have time to finish it today. <laughs> oh, man. This movie, it's getting a little long, guys. Yeah. Just no, let's just get like... to the World Series. We'll, yeah. We'll just cut to the World Series and uh, finish off the, the King Kong motif on the top of Yankee Stadium and... Uh, that'll be the payoff of the movie. God, are they on this podcast? Because I feel like we do that a lot. <laughs> just jump to the end and just like, <laughs> and just finish it. Just finish it. Um, Yeah, th- th- there's just a-, a whole chunk of this movie that was missing. Like somebody literally just went in, snipped it, took it out, and then just glued the film back together and said, here you go. You didn't care about all the the feelings and the, you know, character development, right? You didn't want any of that because we just cut it out. Just cut it out and it I, out the window. I, I observed at some point that there's no possible way that his name is Steve Nebraska. Like he There's cho- no way. He chose that name. Yes. To get away from his original name. And, and at some point, like they, they go through this whole press conference again where where they come up with this whole backstory they make him do another press conference after the one he did earlier where he flipped out and and uh they have him come up with this whole backstory where he says i was in the middle east for four years and i <laughs> i'm from the middle i'm from the midwest and i'm not going to elaborate on it and apparently there are no journalists present because none of them ask a good follow-up question or do any investigating afterwards which no. they totally would have done right they would have that this kid's backstory would have been the front page of the New York Times that same day. <laughs> He's from this place. This was his father. This was his mother. This is how he ended up in Mexico. Every This would not be that hard for a good journalist to uncover. Yeah. Also, but at some point, like, they set up this thing where, like, at some point they're going to reveal his parents. And that's going to be a traumatic thing. And then him and Al are going to have to to deal with that. And then that never fucking happens and they just end the fucking movie. Right. That was weird that they brought up this whole thing about his dad. And then, no, we're not going to meet the dad. We're not going to involve the dad at all. No. Because no. this is Al's journey and not his. Well, here's the, the other thing, too, is, like, in the 90s, 
it, it, it maybe it's just because that's what we remember the most as as teenagers in the 90s to be a sports celebrity you really needed to push the envelope. You needed to be fucking wild. I think of like Dennis Rodman. I think like, you know, dyeing the hair, shit tons of piercings, tattoos all over the place. You That was where like really expressing yourself and being wild really kind of hit. And I think about that because in this, in, in one scene of this film, like the first um, kind of like the Dodgers uh, getting the questions or not the Yankees, sorry. They're uh, getting the questions from uh, the paparazzi or the the journalist or whatever, and he doesn't want to answer questions. And he picks up one of the the journalists and, like, puts him over his head. Like, that would have been all over a newspaper. <laughs> like, every news show back then. Like, and then, it, but people just loved him because he was, he was, even though he looked kind of violent, what's he going to do next? And that would have been, like, a whole 90s powerful sports figure. That's just that. That's what popped into my head. Oh, yeah. Imagine the New York Daily News headlines the day after this guy picks up a gives a a, a journalist an airplane spin. Yeah. Out of yeah. Professional wrestling. <laughs> that w- it would have been splashed everywhere. Every newspaper would have had it. Every <laughs> news outlet would have had it. And again, I wish that they kind of had did, d- done something with that, too. He's again, he is pretty loose. He's a loose cannon. He's doing lots of crazy shit. It, like, I almost wonder if they could have made a movie where they where he he takes this like you know even though he has the childlike wonder and kind of the naivety i i would wonder if they could have taken this movie and made him which i think they they almost did there was a scene in the movie too where he yells at al yeah. and like i'm the yankee you're not like i like you give him like a big head and then he's all over the news screens and I'm boring the fuck out of both of you. I'm so sorry, no, I'm listening. We're listening to you. Oh. You're you're on a run here. We're letting you. Well, no. Um, yeah, just zone. <laughs> but yeah, um, is it, it? It would have been more interesting to see them, um, kind of give him a big head, and then he goes out there and then he doesn't perform, even though he's a, he's a great player. Like he doesn't throw the right pitch, and then it all comes kind of crashing down. Like to me, it, that'd be a better trope. But it'd be more, it's a more predictable trope. Yeah. Yeah. But it would be more realistic as well. Yeah, though. I more, mean, much more realistic. More realistic than him uh, striking out every player in every inning yeah. <laughs> of the game. He throws the most perfect game, not just a perfect game. He throws the most perfect game. Yeah. Whereas, he, like, everybody gets three pitches, they're all strikes and they're all outs. Yeah. <laughs> That's what, which has never happened in the history of Major League Baseball, but then no one's ever thrown 109 miles per hour before <laughs> in Major League Baseball. 103, I think, is the said, Yeah, I think he's like 103. That. No one's ever thrown 109. The catcher doesn't tend to fall down every time they catch the ball, <laughs> which would be kind of hard to, like, you'd have to, I don't know if he could call a strike. The The catcher has to literally tell the umpire that it was a strike, and the umpire goes, it was a strike! Oh my God. Against that heavy hitting power hitter Ozzy Smith. At oh, the end, you know, hey, you were you were pretty bitter about that, Sean. <laughs> well, they scripted it. So Ozzy Smith is a legend. Like, uh, t- started playing when I was like two years old. Uh-huh. Like, that's when how long ago he was uh, a major league baseball star. But he's like this rail thin, really fast you know, guy who gets on base in front of the guys who get bigger hits and knock in runs. And they scripted here to, that Ozzy Smith has hit five home runs in the postseason and is just this big, unbeatable power hitter. That's just not the case. And like you can just tell Bob Costas, they have him calling the the World Series game. And like Bob Costas has to say, improvises it, clearly improvises a line because Michael Ritchie apparently doesn't know anything about baseball. Uh, That's clear with this movie. (laughs) Even though he directed two Black News Bears movies and probably a couple other baseball movies I'm forgetting, doesn't know anything about baseball. I guess Ozzy Smith was available that day. I don't know. I don't know why they he could afford like, to get Ozzy Smith and like Keith Hernandez, but you couldn't afford a consultant on how <laughs> baseballs ran. How does that work? <laughs> God. Like, maybe he knows baseball, but they gave it to an editor who knows nothing right, about baseball. Is, <laughs> that'd be me in there going, they, they, they use the, the pig skin for the ball. <laughs> And they hit it with a croquet mallet. <laughs> but you can tell, like, Costas has a, a very unusual amount of power for Ozzy Smith in the postseason. And you're like, shut the fuck up, Costas. <laughs> no. Liar. I was proud of him for coming <laughs> up with the. No, he obviously had to improvise yeah. the stupid line that he was given that, like, Ozzy Smith is the biggest power hitter in baseball. <laughs> it looked like he was looking at, a, like, a teleprompter that was just a green screen. I, can almost, I almost felt like he was annoyed 
that, yeah. that he had to like like you guys don't know what the fuck you're talking about <laughs> so i'll get i'll make it make sense for you i mean you're bob costas you're like <laughs> president of sports back then you know <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he has to improvise a line that'll make it make sense when he strikes out the heavy hitting Ozzy Smith, which he does. But again, they couldn't ask him, hey, hey, Bob, does this sound right to you? <laughs> a guy who's never pitched before that the entire team has never seen before that uh, has never thrown a pitch in a Major League Baseball game or been seen even by any member of the team before yeah, gets to start the World Series. Yeah, that no, works. totally. That, <laughs> that just happened last season. <laughs> Run with it. Come I will on. say this. I will say this for the for the for the baseball. Uh, Brendan Fraser's character, uh, um, Mark Montana, uh, he, <laughs> it almost sounds like his real name. <laughs> like that could be a real name. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. He actually does foreshadow yeah. a guy who's playing baseball today. Uh, this, uh, the best player in major league baseball is a guy who, who can pitch. He's a great pitcher. Uh, I can't, his name is escaping me right now, but, uh, he's, he's a, he's a place for the Dodgers. He, Bats from both sides of the plate. He hits home runs and he pitches. He is he's essentially Steve, Steve Nebraska. Oh my god! <laughs> wow. Yeah. Because I th- there was a point in the movie where Steve Nebraska actually said, "Hey, can I go to this side yeah. of the plate?" Like he actually <laughs> went to the other side of the when plate. When he's facing Brett, Brett Saberhagen. That's the name I was trying to remember. Which is why the Royals wrote about that movie because Saberhagen was a, was a was one of their top pitchers. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I did not know that. And I his just name remembered is his Brett name. Brett Saberhagen. He had, I mean, come on. That's a pretty metal last name. <laughs> Sab- like, I want to pronounce it more like Saberhagen. Like, I want to do it that. You know what I mean? <laughs> Brett Saberhagen. Like, he carries a sword, like, everywhere. Like, that's what he hits the ball with. Like, <laughs> a sword. <laughs> That'd be so great. Oh, that is so metal. That is Catch this. Definitely. But again, to the point, though, that these people who made this movie don't know anything about baseball. Yeah. <laughs> At the Having him play for the Yankees is kind of a weird thing. Like, it makes sense in the World Series because the World Series... Uh, well, no, it doesn't make any sense in the world. In Major League <laughs> Baseball at the time, the American League players didn't – the pitchers didn't hit. Yeah. So you wouldn't have a guy who can hit the ball play in the American League. You'd have him play in the National League because they have a pitcher that hits. Right. So, again, another example of this movie about baseball that nobody making it knows how <laughs> baseball works. <laughs> <laughs> So what you're saying is I could have made this movie. <laughs> I mean, if all you have to have is a rudimentary notion of what baseball is. Well, and I know who Steve Garvey was. I like I know all these names only because he had baseball cards all over his room. So I remember looking at him and going, Oh, yep, I know that guy, I know that guy. I know baseball players' names. I don't know shit about the game. But we did get to see the Cubs in eighty six. I do remember that. And Steve Garvey's stupid toupee. Steve Garvey. Fucking monster. Fucking monster. History's greatest monster. Is he really? Was he a horrible person? He's, he's, oh my. Do you not know? I what? know his name. I didn't know any background. What did he do? He was on Baywatch. <gasps> I know. Oh, no. You know who else was on Baywatch? Terry Hulk Hogan. Yeah. He was a terrible person. Yeah. There's so much Baywatch. Anyway, uh, yeah. no. No, he, he hit a home run. Off of uh, against against the Cubs in the playoffs in in eighty six and the Cubs didn't get to go or not eighty six eighty four and the Cubs didn't get to go to the World Series <gasps> in eighty four. So Steve Garvey, history's greatest monster. He can go fuck himself, and all of you that have the Garvey last name. <laughs> the entire Garvey line. The entire Garvey line. I'm sorry. I don't even know if you're born yet. I, you could be a great grandchild. You're I, fucked. Dude. I hope I hope grudges. <laughs> I can do that, right? I can curse bloodlines. <laughs> I have that power. That's no, I think he is running for the Senate, though. And I... I mean, you could probably guess. I thought so. It's like when you told me, like, Dirk Benedict said certain <laughs> things, and I'm like, I bet you Dirk that guy is a Republican. <laughs> Looked him up, sure as shit, he was on Fox News. It's like, you just know by their names that that's what they are. I was just, I don't know, I was doing some research, and I came across this Dirk Benedict guy who was, uh, he was on the A-Team, and he was on Battlestar Galactica years, that's, like, the, the yeah. er, before you were born Battlestar, not the one, the recent one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he was giving an interview about a movie that he made, and he said, uh, uh, I like women. I don't like women on the set. 
They always cause and shit. There's, 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 like having women on the set is just a bad thing. They're emotional. They mess up the vibe. It, just like I don't want women on my movie set unless you take off their tops and they don't <laughs> talk. Then it's fine. <laughs> Which is so yeah, yeah. It's a different time, you know. <laughs> I was thinking uh, internalized homophobia, gay person because no women. Yeah, no, I want all uh, men uh, on uh, this. Uh, now that I would have rathered. I, you know? I want nothing but sweaty, sweaty men on my set. Give me, give me Caligula, but take out all the women <laughs> and just have men in sheets, just just running around <laughs> me, flitting about. Derek, uh, I don't know if we can have it. No, no, all men, all men, all men. Is it hot? It's hot outside, right? Make him sweat. Turn the heat on in, in the building. Yeah. Get him chilly. Oh. And motorcycles. Oh. <gasps> Wait, like the actual food chili? <laughs> yeah. Get him a bowl of chili and a motorcycle? I am here for that. You're not allowed. Oh, that's right, because I'm a woman. This is boys only. <laughs> this is boys only. You take We're making a movie. Door, please. <laughs> no girls allowed. <laughs> We do need that sign for the door. I think it'd be hilarious. You think the makers of the scouts are the same thing? No girls. No girls. No girls. Please, no girls. Diane Weist is our mom, and that's all. <laughs> I mean, unless they're going to show up and be pretty and not talk, I don't want them in the film. Like Wait. his love interest. Like uh, the, the to me. What's her first name? Something to me. It's like Jen- Jennifer to me. I think yeah. Is her name. The, yeah. He he is. She is. Uh, she is Max Tennessee's uh, love interest. All right. But. The good news is Bob South Carolina had nothing to do with her in the end. <laughs> you're worried though. That's when he has the breakdown with Al, like says, I'm the Yankee, you're not just like really and then he angrily gets in the car with her to go home with her. And we're like, I'm not sure she should be alone with him right I, now. Honestly, <laughs> he's got a little rage. Jesus. Maybe she should get in a car with the bear. <laughs> God. We were all worried for her. We were all for a little for a her. moment. And yeah. then, you know, they they brought it back, but yeah. You know. Well, we, we never all get know. To, we never get to see uh, um, Brendan outside of the context of Brooks's character. Isn't that weird? We never see Steve Nebraska outside of the context of him being with Al. So it's kind of like uh, Fight Club. <laughs> like Tyler Durden, like they're they're the same person, maybe? <laughs> I mean, that's how I'd like to see it. I would have liked, a, though, a scene where we just got to see, like, Steve being Steve. Yeah. You know, like like Steve doing laundry. Steve eating a bowl of or Steve cereal. just interacting with anyone who isn't Albert Brooks. Like they insist on keeping Albert Brooks even in the scene where he's in therapy. Yeah. Like when he's watching when he's looking at the pictures. Like they insist on having Brooks in that scene. And it feels like that's just again, uh, he read the script and he's like, I'm gonna I'm playing the lead character, so I need to be in more scenes. Not to blame Brooks. I think he tried to, yeah. to, to improve this. I think he tries to improve everything that he's in. Absolutely. But I I don't think he I don't think anybody understood that this movie, though it's called The Scout, is not about the Scout. Yeah. <laughs> he's like the he's like the least useful character in the yeah. entire movie. <laughs> he's constantly he's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> but he's also the catalyst. But he's also not the subject of the movie because the, everybody else, like the dynamic between Brendan Fraser and and Diane Weist is more interesting. Way more interesting. A character like Brendan Fraser's, you know. Uh, Brian New Mexico yeah. is yeah. is uh, like, is more interesting in his character dynamic with anyone other than him. See if they just would have called the movie Dave South Dakota, I think we'd be fine. Because <laughs> then we know what the movie is about. <laughs> Dave if South. This movie Dakota. was called Steve Nebraska. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, ultimately, it, actually, that name would be that would be kind of a cool because then you're well, like what's attention this about? grabbing yeah, yeah. you, you want to know what's this guy about and then of course you tell a story about him that reveals that he's that's not his real name yeah and that he's got a tragic backstory with his parents and uh you kind of dispense with that revealing who they are and dismissing them for being cruel and uh you know him finding new family and yeah. finding new success as a major league baseball player that's a very interesting story that this movie should be telling and is it yeah <laughs> and again i love you albert but like let's c- kind of cut some of those scenes down we could tell he's he's just he's a frazzled scout yeah but he doesn't need to be the star like we could just have him be like that's the character and then you know yeah i mean if if steve feels like he's kind of like a dad to him then then we can explore that but we don't need as much of him in the film right Steve, the, the film called steve nebraska i think would be a 
in our own heads, just a better film. Overall. But the the energy between him and Brendan Fraser is there. Like yeah. that could work. Yeah. If the movie recognized that Fraser is the more yeah. far more complex and interesting character. Uh, and exploring him is far more interesting than anything that Albert Brooks is doing in the movie. Can we say Brendan's got beautiful hair in this movie? <laughs> I just want to put my hand through it. Not really, like just in my it's head. A long, I lustrous mullet. It is. It looks fantastic on him. Like he could wear that today. He's still good. Yeah. Well, like, he... but it, like you could wear this hair today and and be hip, which is weird because I I don't know. At times, it got a little big. Got a little big. I wonder if those were reshoots where he's wearing a wig. I like because really because like early that. on, you could see like it looked pretty good, but then when they get to some of the New York scenes, it kind of looks like. Like uh, they they had to put a wig on him to get, get him back to the it, character. You know what? If anything, they probably gave him something like a fall in the back. Like maybe he had his hair cut because the top looked pretty good, but back here and even the way that they kind, it was of, kind of pooing, poofing out, fanning out. Yeah, but you could definitely tell that they had like lots of tresemme, kind of crunched over where they could clip in maybe that hair in the back. That's what it looked yeah, like to me. Yeah. So, I think that definitely happened. Yeah. Because all of you guys in the 90s, especially at this point, this is where that mullet started coming off. We were cutting them all off, getting rid of them. So maybe that, you know, I think it was the time. And it was the right thing to do and it should have stayed that way. Just say, I'm Thank just saying. You. I'm just saying. Thank you. Ah. Should have stayed that way. That's true. Should oh, never come yeah. back. I, I went to... I went to high school with way too many mullet heads. Yeah, and you know what? And it's not even fun or ironic. It's no. just to do it and you look like a fucking chode. Well, not Curtis. Thing- <laughs> not Curtis. So- it's that thing where some be- something begins as an ironic appreciation and then people forget that they're supposed to be laughing at it. And they, yeah. it, it just becomes like the joke becomes reality. Yeah. It stops being fun. <laughs> <laughs> just like this podcast. This podcast was brought to you by the Pontiac Fiero. The Coleman Francis of cars. That's an insult to Coleman Francis. Is it? <laughs> he's, he's dead. The director of Terminal Velocity. Oh, I don't remember his name. <laughs> no, that was he directed Terminal Velocity. Oh, if Coleman Francis directed Terminal Velocity, I thought he did. He better. <laughs> wouldn't have been. Wouldn't have been awesome if like the the Beast of Yucca Flats showed up in Terminal Velocity. <laughs> oh no, because that was the worst movie of Coleman Francis's. <laughs> was Horrible. there an actual beast? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess. No, it was just a guy who got struck by lightning or something like that. He became a beast? Well, he... Yeah, I guess. And he he walked through the Yucca Flats a lot. (laughs) No, he he was a normal guy. Like, he was a cop. And then I, I I keep wanting to say he got struck by lightning, and then after that, all of a sudden, he was, like, killing people. So... That's how it happened. He was the beast of Yucca Flats. Yucca Flats. There it is. Where are you, redheaded guy from Terminal Velocity? I don't know. You know what? But I will put this out there. If you want my number, I will give it to you. Just find us on Facebook. We are we're there. It's 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 there. We need proof that that was your hair. We need well. If you could send us a lock of your hair <laughs> and maybe some of your DNA. <laughs> um, I'd like to make it as creepy as possible. That's what I'd like to do. I doubt he still has red hair. I'm just saying. Especially if it's that red that's very yeah. vibrant. Yeah. It's very vibrant. It's probably color. faded into like a blonde now. Mm-hmm. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you about next week's movie and you have to guess what it is. Oh boy. Based off the premise. A childhood ed- incident is convinced Faith Corvatch that her true love is a guy named Damon Bradley, but she has yet to meet him. Preparing to settle down to marry a foot doctor, Faith impulsively flies to Venice when it uh, seems that she may be able to finally encounter the man of her dreams. Instead, she meets the charming Peter Wright. But they, but uh, can they fall in love if she still believes that she's intended to be with someone else? It's crazy because mom loved this movie. Is it only you? Yes, it is. Directed by Norman Jewess. Robert Dowdy Jr. And oh. and we get our, our baboon loving heart, Marissa Tomei, back for this movie. And, she, and they, they both look fabulous. And actually, I have really fond memories of this movie. So Bonnie oh. Hunt. Bonnie Hunt. Billy Zane. Bonnie Hunt. <laughs>
Don't ever say Billy Zane to me. <laughs> He's in the movie. He's so weird. He's in the movie. He's creepy. Yeah. That reminded me of New Girl. I think somebody's or oh, it was um uh there's a line. Schmidt started a Billy Zane fan club. Oh no. And then um uh Jess goes, That makes me so angry. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on a new girl binge lately. <laughs> it's a great such a show. great line, too. Thank My you. God, it makes me so angry. God bless. Yeah, that's next week. Good luck. All right. <laughs>